Dr. Rebecca Doggett, PhD, is an assistant clinical professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the Hassenfeld Children's Hospital at NYU Langone Health and clinical director of the Autism Spectrum Disorder Service. She is a specialist in autism spectrum disorder and conducts diagnostic evaluations as well as provides individual and group treatments for children, adolescents, and young adults with autism spectrum disorder and other neurodevelopmental disorders. She is the project director for the New York City Regional Center for Autism Spectrum Disorder, a state funded grant to provide workshops and technical assistance in autism to the five boroughs. She completed her pre-doctoral internship and post-doctoral fellowship at the Yale Child Study Center with a specialization in ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. She has extensive training in pivotal response treatment, a naturalistic behavior intervention. Through, through her doctoral program training, who was with Drs. Lynn and Robert Cagle at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Doggett. We're so happy to have you here with us. Welcome to Synergia. Dr. Doggett, as you know, we find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic facing so much uncertainty and challenges we've never really imagined to find ourselves in. Our experience here in New York City has been filled with so many twists and turns when it comes to how to protect ourselves, how to pay our bills, how to secure housing, and for our parents, ensuring our children continue to learn despite the interruptions and curveballs this pandemic continues to put us all through. This brings us to our topic today of how to create and design at-home learning environments for our children with autism. And without further ado, Dr. Daga, I leave it all to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to talk with, with you and uh, for all of your, your parents that are out there. Um, so today we are talking about setting up an at-home learning environment for children with ASD. Um, we're going to be focusing on strategies that we know are helpful for children with autism, but uh, these are strategies that are helpful for all kids. So I'm hoping that even if you don't have a child with ASD, um, you, you're still able to take away some helpful strategies. Um, this presentation is brought to you by the New York State Regional Center for Autism at the Child Study Center. Uh, we are one of um, seven university affiliated sites across New York State that provide workshops and trainings in autism. And uh, following this work workshop, you'll receive an evaluation form through your email. And we would very much appreciate you filling out the evaluation uh, as it helps us inform uh, what programming and topics the community is interested in hearing about. So I welcome you to um, put any questions into the chat uh, or into the Q&A box, I mean, as we go along. Uh, I realize that I can't, I don't think I can see it as I'm going, but I will spend some time at the end uh, going over some of those questions. So I will review them uh, towards the end of the presentation. So today we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, we're going to talk about how to draw on the strengths of kids with autism to set them up for success in uh, the home learning environment. We'll talk about how to use breaks and how to prepare kids for transitions. Uh, and then lastly, we'll just touch on collaboration with schools at the end. So to start out, um, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen. Um, and that we're all trying to do our best in a really extremely challenging time. Um, and uh, along those lines, there's, there's no one right way uh, to get from point A to point B. We're all uh, experiencing these challenges together, trying to figure it out as we go along. And I know at this point into the pandemic, there's a lot of fatigue and a lot of different ways setting in. Um, and I'm hopeful that this presentation, um, you can take away um, just you know one or two strategies that you might be able to think about how to use in, in your home with your kids. Um, but just know that uh, you, you are doing the best that you can um, under extremely difficult circumstances. And if things aren't going perfectly, uh, that's understandable. And in no way are you the only person experiencing that. So as we're thinking about how to support kids with autism, we want to think about their strengths. 
Um, so kids with autism really thrive on visual information. They're, they're generally visual learners. So we want to use a lot of visual strategies with them. They are really um, responsive to routines. So we want to think about how to create routines and how to stick with routines. Um, kids with autism benefit from very explicit instruction. So explicit what to do, what not to do, so that um, expectations are really clear. Many kids with, in, uh, with autism have very strong interests in particular topics. And where we can, we wanna draw on these really strong interests to help motivate them. So whether that's through their academic work or as a reward, um, we really wanna see if there's a way to incorporate these strong interests to keep them motivated, especially when learning is involved and it's easy to lose your motivation. Kids with autism uh, often have very acute sensory uh, uh, perception. Um, they might like a lot of different kinds of sensory input. Um, they might need a lot of different kinds of sensory input. Um, and we want to see how we can uh, integrate that into their day to facilitate their attention and maintain uh, a kind of even energy level while they're trying to learn. We want to consider um, strengths of the family and resources of the family and thinking about what do we know works for kids with autism. Um, we will always want to think about that and see if we can employ some of those strategies. So let's talk first about setting up the home learning environment. Um, and just as a caveat, uh, before I start talking about this, um, I've included some images here, but um, I know full well that apartments in New York City do not necessarily look like these pictures. Um, I know mine does not. Um, so um, it's hard to find pictures uh, that are readily available that really describe some of the constraints that families living in very small spaces are under. So um, I'm not, uh, if, you, if your space doesn't look like this, I understand most people in New York City don't, but it's just a guideline of kind of like thinking about, is there something you can take away from this that would work in your space? So I appreciate that New York City families are under an even bigger stress with that um, lack of space. Many families have multiple kids at home who are trying to learn at the same time and finding space for them all to do that is challenging, let alone finding space for one person. So I appreciate that. Um, and so not to say that this is the only way to do it, but these are just some images that might help you think about um, some strategies that might work in your space. So we want to think about dedicating a specific space for learning and preferably a structured space that has a chair and a table or a desk. So something that would approximate what a child would be um, learning at if they were in the school classroom. Um, providing a chair and providing a table or desk gives them that structure and those cues of, I am learning right now. I'm not watching TV. I'm not relaxing. I'm not playing. When I sit in this chair and I sit at my desk or I sit at the table, I'm kind of getting into school learning mode. Those are kind of those external cues and we want to present those. So we want to avoid having kids engage in virtual learning in spaces where it's not really conducive to learning, like their bed or the couch or other spaces that are more suited to relaxation. So think about this in your space. Um, it might be the kitchen table or the dining room table. That might be the only table that you have available. Um, but try and find a chair and a surface that is dedicated to learning um, and is uh, not something like a bed or a couch where it's just going to be, as we all know, probably hard to engage in real good focus and work when you're reclined um, in, in the bed. We also wanna think about limiting distractions that are around the learning area. So um, you wanna take away or remove any items that are not needed for learning from the immediate vicinity. So what's nice about um, these pictures that you can see, like the one on the right, is the table is all clear, it's just the laptop. So there's no other stuff on the table, there's no papers, there's, um, you know, nothing that's like a toy or that's gonna distract them. Um, so that's important. I would say it's a balance though between 
making sure there aren't distractions, but also having things that are necessary for learning readily available. So you can see in the left-hand side, maybe this um, the student is a little bit older and they have some binders, um, they have their headphones, they have some pens and, uh, and pencils available. So they have it right there if they need it, but there's no other extraneous stuff that they don't need for their school day. So depending on your student, uh, how old they are, their, their, um, their needs, uh, the space might look a little bit different, but we want to make sure that it's as cleared of other things as possible. So here are some other uh, examples, and I'll talk a little bit about younger kids just briefly. So especially for younger children, it can be really helpful to give some visual cues that mark the space that they're going to be using for learning. So on the left, this is kind of a a unique picture. I think it's designed for a home, kind of a home-based uh, learning environment with multiple children. Um, but what I want you to take away from it is how the visual markers are being used here. So you can see that each child has that placemat that they'd be sitting at on the floor, just like in a preschool classroom or a kindergarten classroom where they often have marked um, squares on a carpet or little carpet squares that they move around with them to sit on, those visual cues that mark their space are really important. So if you're using a floor, especially for a young child who um, you might or you might need to because of space, <clears throat> If, you're, if you need to use the floor, really try and mark that space with a visual cue. It might be if you have a placemat or if you do have a carpet square or if you have a pillow, um, all of those things could be used as a visual cue of here's where your learning space is, here's where the boundaries are of where you're gonna stay during that learning time. If you do have um, space for some, um, furniture or chair and table for, a, for a, a small child, that's wonderful. So you can see in the middle picture, this is a, a smaller child. He has a smaller kid sized chair and a smaller kid sized table. It's the right size for him. Sometimes what happens is that um, the size of the furniture um, is too big for the kid. So if the kid is sitting at an adult size dining room table and an adult size chair in there in preschool, it's just gonna be a mismatch. It's really hard for them to keep contained in a big chair. They can't really reach the table easily. A lot of times they're up on their knees or up on their feet and it's just really not conducive to learning. So really try and match the space um, that you're using for learning to the size of the child. And you might say that, okay, well, you just told us to have them sit at a table and chair. <laughs> yes, they did. But if your child is small and you think that the floor and marking a space on the floor is going to be better for them, then absolutely go with that. It's better than a mismatch of furniture where the kid's just all over the place and can't really use that structure that you're putting into place with having them at the table. The picture on the right, I think, is a really nice um, uh, example of how you could use a visual boundary to demarcate a learning space that you might be using for other purposes. So this is, you know, likely a family's kitchen or dining room table. Um, and <laughs> during learning time, they've indicated with the tape on the table and the tape on the floor, this is your learning space. So during the school day, this is a learning space. This is like your desk or your, you know, where you would be in the school, um, in the school classroom environment. So those are some different examples of how to just create a little bit of a space using the resources that you have and the space and, and furniture that you have. So I talked a little bit about this a couple slides ago, but you do wanna have some organization um, to your space if you can. So like I said, you wanna have items that a child is going to need during the school day that are readily available to them. Um, for one thing, it helps minimize the getting up and getting down or the like, mom, I need you to find this thing for me, or I need this, or I need that for school. Um, and so if everything or most of the things they need are close to them and are clearly um, in a space and an organization where they can easily find something, it's going to minimize that kind of um, uh, those the distractions that can come from needing to take time to go find something or to ask a parent about what to do. Um, so you can use <coughs> lots of different things. Um, if you have some shelves, just designate a shelf for school materials, whether that's crayons or markers or pencils. Um, depending on the age of the child, there might be different kinds of materials. So an older kid is going to have um, maybe some papers and um, 
they need more files or like a, a file folder or like you can see on the left hand side there. So it's going to depend on the age of your child, um, but try and think about having the things that your child needs day to day right in their vicinity and easily findable. Um, so the middle um, example is showing two shelves and the notes, I'm not sure if you can read on the side, but they're showing that one shelf is dedicated to one of the child, the, one of the children in the family, the second child in the family gets the lower shelf so that they're not, um, you know, trying to use all their stuff and getting in a fight. Um, it's clearly indicated whose things are on which shelf. Um, then they have on the top things that everybody can use like markers and pencils, um, resources like the globe that they might be using for school, a calendar, timer on the right, that's really important. I'll get to the timer a little bit later on. Um, so that's, that's one way that this uh, example is showing how to manage multiple kids in a family and how to organize space for them. Um, and organization doesn't have to be like something you would see in a model picture like this or on Pinterest. It can be a Tupperware full of pencils. Um, it can be a cup with some markers in it. Um, it can be a little bucket, anything you have lying around the house, just try and keep things in a way um, that is clear um, and organized for the child to find things. Okay, let's talk about breaks, because breaks are really important. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but we want to establish a consistent routine and schedule for kids with autism, especially during the school day. So as much consistency as possible day to day should be there. And a visual schedule is really important. So you can see an example of one visual schedule um, down on the left there, um, but each activity has a picture, is listed, what's coming up, what's coming next, and has goes through that, that um, their school day schedule for them so they can really follow along and see it. It helps with consistency, it helps with predictability. But what I wanna focus on is breaks. So within that schedule, there need to be breaks built in. We all need breaks. We need breaks from Zoom. We've all felt that fatigue of staring at the computer for too long and not being able to take in any more information. Kids are the same way and they need even more. So especially kids with autism, they need frequent breaks. Um, so what I would recommend doing is schedule breaks into your schedule proactively and put them into this daily schedule for the child. And they don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be printed. Um, they don't, if a child can read, they're older, can just be listed in, in words. You can jot it out on a piece of paper. Um, <clears throat> If you are able to do uh, make your own kind of makeshift um, schedule, just looking at images on Google and putting them into a document, um, you don't even need to have a printer available. You can just keep it up on their screen. Um, but I do recommend creating a schedule with breaks built in. So you can see on the left, there's um, that brain break image where the breaks are built in between activities. Um, you can also use a break time card like this or a break time image um, to put in your schedule. Um, so that's another example of how you could indicate that on a schedule. So you have your breaks in the schedule, great. Um, but sometimes kids might need even more breaks, even within, within one class, like, you know, they're doing math and you're noticing that they're fidgeting a lot or they're getting up or they're running around. Um, you want to try and watch for these warning signs where they're losing attention and getting fidgety um, and then try and implement a break before they start bouncing off the walls like this picture on the right. So some warning signs you want to watch for to show that a child might be losing attention and need a break are increased fidgeting, like they're grabbing things, they're kind of squirming around in their seat, maybe they're just getting up, um, walking around or running. Maybe you see some increased sensory seeking behavior, like they are um, putting things in their mouth or they're starting to look at objects from an angle or looking at things very closely, that's what we call peering. Um, or they're engaging in repetitive behaviors. Um, so you might see some of that in, in increased repetitive or sensory seeking behavior as an indication that they need a break. Uh, you might see uh, increased frustration tolerance, uh, sorry, decreased frustration tolerance. So things are just getting them 
like more frustrated more easily or they're they're looking at other things on the computer they're totally distracted so those are the kinds of warning signs where you might start to say okay like they they're they're really starting to need a break before they can settle back down into learning um so um that's fine if it's not on the schedule you're seeing these warning signs we can still allow for a break because Otherwise, they're really not going to get much out of continuing to sit there fidgeting or looking at other things. <clears throat> so when you're thinking at a, about a break, the same way we want to think about the learning space is that we want to try and designate a break space. So um, <coughs> try and get them away from their learning space so that it's clearly different um, and find another alternative space. And it could just be the corner of another room where there's a couple of comfy pillows or a little like rug on the floor. Um, it doesn't have to be as large or, you know, as, as um, decorated as the space that you see here, um, but a separate space where they can go to just decompress. You don't need any special equipment. I'm sure you've all seen, you know, the crazy equipment that you might see in a sensory gym or online. Um, you don't need any of that. You have a lot of things in your home that you can use for break purposes. You can use pillows, you can set up like a little, if you have a little rug, you can put some fidget toys around that space. You can put a couple of books in that space. Beanbag chairs are great, they're comfy. If you don't have one, that's fine. Put something heavy in that space, a really big book if you have one or anything that's heavy because a lot of kids do like to manipulate heavy objects. It helps them get their, um, get their energy out sometimes. If you do have stairs or you have access to stairs, that's a good opportunity for getting some um, energy out as well. <clears throat> in your break space, you could also have some access to something calming like music if they like that. Um, so the idea is that your break space doesn't have to look beautiful. It doesn't have to have all these amazing decorations and pillows and sensory items. You just need a designated space that's a little comfy, um, that's separate from their learning environment has some um, break-like items in it. And I'll show you some more ideas on the, next, um, on the next slide so that it's really clear, okay, I'm in my break space, not learning. I can take a few minutes to just decompress. So what can kids do on a break? There are lots of things. And you especially wanna be able to give them choices of brief activities, including some different options for physical activities, for calm down activities, for things they like, and pictures are really helpful for younger kids. So you can see on the top two pictures, <clears throat> they're like sensory break menus, um, where a child could pick which one they're gonna do for their break. So this menu has Play-Doh or a squishy ball or deep breathing, going to, their, going to a quiet space, um, engaging with a toy. Um, so those are some options that this child had. Um, on the right hand side, there are some items like playing in a, like feeling some sand um, <coughs> or feeling rice as a kind of sensory um, seeking activity um, or looking at a, a tube that has some interesting visual information, listening to something uh, on, you know, in their headphones as music. So these are some break choices that are clear or defined or on a menu and a child can choose from. Um, you can buy endless things online. There are plenty of things, but you don't need to buy special items, special toys, expensive things. There are lots of things you can do at that, around your house that don't involve buying things. So um, something you might do on a break is like, do some yoga poses or put on some music and have a dance party. Um, like I was mentioning before, pushing something heavy across the floor, um, running up and down stairs, taking deep breaths in and out, um, squishing something. If you do have a squishy ball, great. If you have some Play-Doh, great. Um, or uh, a container with um, some rice that they can um, put objects in. A lot of uh, schools will have these kinds of sensory tables with rice or sand that, that um, are nice for kids who like that kind of sensory seeking um, input. Uh, you can make an obstacle course out of pillows and things that you have at home. Um, you can have some sensory input given to them through something with temperature, like a warm thing or a cold thing. Um, so you don't need a lot of fancy items if you're not able to get them. Um, there are lots of options for things that you have around your house, most likely that can be implemented in a short break. 
If you're running out of ideas, the internet is full of them. Um, so if you're able to do a quick search, it might help you um, with some inspiration. Like I pulled these images just off of um, Google. Um, and uh, this one on the left <clears throat> is kind of like a game where you roll dice and it gives you um, something to do depending on what numbers you roll. They're kind of ranging in um, something active like 10 jumping jacks or five wall push-ups or um, touching your like hands and feet in a certain way, kind of like Twister. Um, so it gives, it gives the kids kind of like a little game to play, but also gets them doing something active with their body on a break. Um, the one on the right is showing some different options for, um, for more of a like sensory input kind of break um, with um, something to squeeze or to roll on or to fidget with. Um, or to get a big blanket and kind of wrap and squeeze yourself. Um, so those are more sensory based. The ones on the left are a little bit more um, physical motor active based. Um, but there's lots and lots of great ideas out there. Um, and so if you um, are looking for, looking for more ideas of what to do um, based on what kinds of things you have available to you, I recommend seeing what you can find out there. There's a lot of information. So what's important about breaks is that they can't last forever. Otherwise, um, no one would learn anything um, and nothing, would, nothing else would happen during the day. So breaks need to be time limited and brief. They should really only be a couple of minutes long and the child should know exactly how long their break is gonna be before it starts. And there should be a verbal and a visual cue. Verbal meaning telling them how long, visual meaning a timer. That's a visual timer where they can see how much time they have left in their break. So this is an app called the Time Timer, um, where you set it for a certain amount of time. And um, as the time goes by, that red portion of the pie decreases so that the child can see how much time they have, um, they have left on their break. Even um, in a, uh, uh, there are lots of free apps. If you have a smartphone, even um, on uh, a, a smartphone, the, at least on the iPhone, um, the, the Timer uh, app, in and of itself as a visual timer. It has a little circle and their time you can see uh, goes, goes down in the circle. Um, and so I really recommend using these visual timers alongside telling kids how long their break is gonna be because time is a very abstract concept and um, it doesn't mean a lot to a child to say you have two minutes or three minutes, especially if it's a young kid, because they don't have that concept of time. So it's really helpful for them to be able to see how much time they have, set a limit, and stick to that limit. Similarly, um, breaks shouldn't be activities that your child is likely to get stuck on. So um, if your kid is really into videos or screen time, um, or a particular toy that's related to their interest, those probably aren't great break activities because they're probably likely to get stuck and you might get into a situation where it's harder to transition out of the break. Um, so try and find activities that are, um, have some uh, component to them that your child enjoys but isn't like the most highly valued item. <laughs> Save those for bigger rewards because you, you may need them. When your child is on a break, let the break be a break. Don't ask your child to do other things. Um, don't ask them to, you know, go pick up their room. Limit your instructions and limit your demands. Just let them, let them have that break. Um, don't use it as an opportunity to continue practicing their smelling or their counting. Just let them have that time. If they want to interact with you, that's fine. If they need time alone, um, that is great, just let them be, but let the break be a break from things that they need to focus on. Okay, so my child needs a break and it's not on the schedule, which is gonna happen for sure. Um, so it's better to um, help your child take a break, especially if you're noticing there's a lot of fidgeting and inattention going on in order to avoid a more challenging situation later on. Um, what we want to focus on is teaching a child to advocate for their needs. So advocating and noticing, I need a break and asking for that. Um, but this is hard to do, especially with younger kids. Um, and you may need to help them learn this skill. So you might need to prompt them at first. So you see them starting to fidget, maybe getting up and running around, and you know they need a break. 
So you could say, I noticed that you're running around the room. You can ask for a break. If they can do it verbally, great. If they can't do it, they could point to a picture of a break card or they could give you a break card. So depending on your child's level of communication, could be verbal or nonverbal. And even a verbal kid sometimes needs nonverbal strategies. So give them that option. Um, they can point to the break, they can give her the break card even if they have that language. Um, but the, the point is that we want them to get in the habit of requesting and asking for that break when they need it. You want to reward any attempt the child has communicating uh, their need for a break by letting them have that break and moving to the break area, having a quick two minute um, pause from their school activities. Um, and stay calm. That's really hard to do. Um, our, uh, a lot of um, us might have the instinct of those repeated prompts and yelling, get back here, like sit down, sit down, sit down. Like it's not going to help. So if you stay calm, you prompt, say, I know, see what, comment on what you see. I notice that you're getting really fidgety. I notice that you have a lot of attention. You can ask for a break. Help them learn the skill of saying, I need a break or can I take a break? Um, otherwise, the, the come back here, the yelling, it's not going to work for anybody. You eventually want to fade out your prompt so that they're asking you for a break spontaneously. And that might take some time um, to learn. So you might initially need to have them and ask them, like, you know, you can ask for a break. That's your prompt to them. Um, and then over time, you want to fade that out so that you don't need to ask them. You don't need to say, look, I, here's what I'm seeing. But they're coming and saying, I need a break. Can I take a break? So here are some examples of building this um, skill um, with some of those visual cards that I mentioned. Um, so you could have <coughs> a break card um, that just says, I need a break on it with a clock. Again, you don't need to have a printer or a fancy image for any of this. You could just put it on a piece of paper um, that you have at home. You could just write break on a piece of paper. You could put an image of um, you know, a clock or something um, on a piece of paper. So it doesn't have to be super pretty. Um, you could also have um, the one on the left is like asking for a break um, with some options. So it, you know, a child could point to stretching indicating that they wanna take a stretch break or they wanna take a movement break. Um, so just some examples of how you could build advocacy for having a child ask for a break themselves. So let's talk about supporting transitions because there are a lot of them during the school day. Um, so children with autism often have difficulty moving between activities. Um, we want to help them preview what's coming up as much as we can. We know that that's helpful for them and that's why we recommend having those schedules of the day. That's like the ultimate um, way of previewing. Um, so we, we share information with them. We share the knowns, what's going to happen during the day so that there is as little unexpected activity as we can. Of course, things come up. We can't always plan for them, but as much as we know, we want to share. We also want to practice these steps and routines ahead of time. So going over with them, what's going to happen in the routine. We want to use visuals, especially if it's a younger kid to go along with those, um, uh, those routines. Um, and then uh, if your child is uh, able to communicate with you about, about what's helpful for them during the day, what helps them transition, then listen to those ideas and see if you can come to a collaboration agreement on some strategies that might help them in some of those tricky times. Social stories can be really helpful for priming um, changes in routine and transitions. So if you're not familiar with social stories, um, I put down the, the resource link um, at the bottom there. They were developed by Carol Gray. And a social story is a story, um, just like any kid's story. But the goal is to clarify um, expectations and promote positive coping skills. They can be tailored to any kind of language level. Um, and they're written in a first person language with um, information on what that individual can do in a situation. So it tells you what's gonna happen and what that individual can do. And I'll show you an example here. So this is a social story written by a colleague of mine, Dr. Donnelly, um, and it's about um, the school year this year. Um, so the story goes like this. I will go to school this year, just like I have every other year. This year, the way I learn will be different. This may make me feel anxious. I will go to Yellow Brick Road Elementary School on Mondays and Wednesdays. On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I will learn from home. When I go to the school building, I will wear a mask. 
My teacher and classmates will be wearing masks also. This is to keep everyone healthy and safe. If I feel nervous, I can talk to my teacher, look at books of Pokemon or squeeze my stress ball. I know I can do this because I practiced before. So the story outlines kind of what is gonna happen in terms of that, per, that child's school. So if this kid is in a hybrid learning situation, they're going to school some of the days and they're staying home some of the days to learn. Um, and it provides information about what's gonna happen. And not only that, but what they can do if they are um, having difficulty or they're feeling nervous about it. Um, so it's written in an encouraging way and in an informative way and in that first person language. We also want to use visuals to support transition. So here's a visual at the top that goes along with that story of the calendar showing Monday and Wednesday, they're at the school building, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they're learning from home via Zoom. Um, so that's a, that's a good way to support a large transition of like that day to day of the week. Um, but there are lots of small transitions during the day between activities and classes um, and depending on the age of your child, there may be more or less of them. <laughs> um, so you can see that um, the um, schedule there in the daily schedule, it's probably more suited for, for an older child um, uh, who might be a little bit more independent. Um, it's all written out for them. Um, the, the chunks of time are pretty large. Um, and so that's something that they can follow along with. Um, other ways to support transitions, we've talked about visual timers. The post-its are a really low tech way of supporting transitions that are kind of similar to a visual timer if you don't have one. Um, so what you need is five pieces of paper. Post-its are great if you have them. And you write uh, the numbers one through five and one number goes on each post-it and you start with five on the top. So let's say the child is given a five minute break and that five post-it is on the top. Once a minute has gone by, you take off the five so that you see the four posted underneath it. That means that there are four minutes left. After another minute, see the three, two, one. It doesn't have to be five minutes. You could use this for three minutes or two minutes or one minute, um, but it helps them see that time is passing and approximately how long it's been each minute. So it's similar to the visual timer, but if you don't have that, um, you don't have a smartphone or you don't have a way of, of um, getting a visual timer, you can use those pieces of paper to help them see time passing and how much time they have left before they need to transition to their next activity. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see a very specific schedule to help transitions for a morning routine. So this is probably a, um, a schedule that's used for a child who's actually going to school in the classroom, but um, the idea is that you kind of indicate each step of the morning. So they take their homework folder, they put it into their backpack, they take their hand sanitizer and they get on the bus. So that's a very, um, concrete part of the day that there's a schedule for. And that can be helpful if there is a particularly difficult part of the day. So if your child often has difficulty in the morning or has difficulty in the evening with dinner, bedtime, bath time, might be helpful to have a specific schedule for the routine just for that portion of the day. Um, big schedules like the one that you see for the daily schedule in the middle there can often be quite overwhelming for younger kids, especially. Um, so it helps to break into chunks, um, just show them the morning, show them the afternoon, um, rather than the whole thing at, the, at a time, because that can be quite, quite a lot to look at. So a lot of families have said to me, uh, my kid just needs a break all the time. They can't, they can't sit there, they're zoomed out from learning. And I get it. Um, so that might be true. Some kids may find it extremely difficult to attend to remote school. Um, and uh, I've been talking to many, many, many families who are, are experiencing that. Um, and in some cases, it may be helpful to think about how to motivate your child. You may need to put in some external motivation for keeping them engaged in their classes and their, in their online learning. Um, so we want to start small and reward. So you may have a child who can't sit for even a minute in front of the screen without running away and leaving. Um, and this, I think, tends to especially be true for um, like preschool kids, younger kids, kindergarten, first grade, um, before they've really learned some of those learning to learn skills about sitting and attending. Um, and you may need to start really small with your expectations and reward them gradually for doing that. So you might even just start at rewarding them for sitting and attending just for one minute. 
um, followed by a reward, a short break with something they like, a toy, some jumping jacks, music, and then bring them back. And the idea is you're gonna slowly increase this over time. So um, as they get used to sitting in one minute intervals, then you bump that up to two minute intervals, then they get their reward. So you wanna gradually teach them how to sit for longer periods of time. So that's an extreme example with a very, probably more suited for a young kid, but there, there are lots of kids who are feeling very fatigued, who are older, um, and just, you know, class turns on and they're doing other things already on the computer. Um, and so you may think about, okay, how can I motivate my child to sit and attend and focus? Um, and so you can use reward charts for that. Um, so that they're able to fully participate, keep their camera on, learn, uh, you know, complete their in-class work. Um, they're gathering points or stickers uh, for a reward at the end of the day. And that might be something like a special treat or a special dessert or a special extra time on their, um, their screens. Um, uh, and so <laughs> depending on the child, that reward might be different, but you may need to think about how can I externally motivate my child if they're really struggling to focus, participate fully um, and engage in the school day. Um, so some of these examples are visuals of, of reward boards. Um, I am working for this. It kind of really spells out the reward. You might use this for a younger kid or a kid with, with more limited language. Same with the first then on the right. Um, and the, the middle one is more of a, for an older child, um, reward chart of earning their points. <laughs> um, I would definitely recommend consulting with anybody in your school team, like a school psychologist, um, who can help you think about how to set up a program like this if your child really is struggling. It does help to consult with, um, with a psychologist who, who does a lot of these kinds of behavioral programs um, to think about what, what should I be rewarding and how can I implement this. But some families are really going to need to use external rewards if the child is struggling inherently themselves to stay focused, pay attention, and engage. So along those lines, collaboration with school is really important. Um, like I said before, if you're really struggling with your child's behavior at home and at home learning, I would very, very strongly recommend that you touch base with their IEP team um, and your contact at, at school. Um, because they're, they're there to help you kind of problem solve some of these challenges. You also um, want to spend some time looking at your child's IEP and supports that the child would be getting otherwise in the classroom and see if you can adapt them to your home. Look at those accommodations. See, are there things that would be helpful that I can mimic as best I can in the home environment that the child is getting at school? Um, lots of kids with ASD, like I said, need visuals or they need physical manipulatives to solidify learning. So the abstract learning or the abstractness of a computer screen can be really hard. So the more items that you might have in your home that can be used to, to um, help them physically um, understand concepts, whether that's counting or math, um, talk with your school team, talk with your, talk with your teacher about what, what could be helpful in, in engaging my student with some things, actual things <laughs> that they can engage with because the screen is just very removed. It's very removed for everybody. I think we've experienced that. So the more you can bring it to life, the better. And your teachers um, can hopefully give you some suggestions around that. And consult with, with your child's therapist as well. Um, the speech and language pathologist or OT if you have them, your physical therapist if your child is working with one of them, they might have more suggestions for activities and sensory breaks and break activities and um, that they've been working on with the child and that you could integrate as well. Um, so um, I'm gonna, I put some links here for some additional resources. The Sunfield Center came out with a really great resource that's dedicated to at-home learning. Um, there's a document, that PDF link there at the bottom. They also have a video. Um, you can just search for Sunfield Center um, and it will, it will come up, um, but they have these resources that are specific to setting up at-home learning environments, which I thought would be helpful um, and some helpful tips for parents. Um, and then here are some other just general COVID-19 specific resources for, for ASD um, around um, COVID, around um, back to school, just general, um, general resources that, that are out there for families and navigating, navigating COVID. Um, 
So um, I want to stop there so that I have enough uh, time. We've got 10 minutes left. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the Q&A. Otherwise, I can't see it. And I know that there were a number of questions that were submitted prior. So hopefully, I will be able to answer um, some of those. Let me pull up the Q&A here. Thank you so much, Dr. Doggett. That was really informative. We have a few questions already in the Q&A that we maybe should, could go to first. Uh, <clears throat> one question that has been really voted popular by our participants today is, I have to stay close to my child during her classes to keep her focused on the teacher and the lesson. Do you have any tips for how to set up a workspace when a parent is involved with helping the teacher? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what this question is getting at is um, like how to set up a workspace where a parent is really heavily involved in, in the learning experience or needs to be there. Um, yes, and I think a lot of parents are experiencing this and certainly um, <clears throat> some kids really do need that one-to-one -one support from, from their parents who engage. Um, I think the same ideas about setting up the workspace would still apply. You still want to figure out, okay, where's where is a workspace that's suitable for the child, depending on like their size and space, and then figure out um, where your position can be. And as, as structured as possible, if, if you are able to stay with the child for the majority of their, their school day, that's wonderful. I know some parents can and some parents can't, um, but you can, you can have your chair, you can have their, your chair beside them. Um, or you can have your pillow on the floor next to them. I would, I would have yourself in close proximity so that you can help be there for any physical prompts that you might need to, or kind of verbal prompts that you might need to make. Um, sometimes like the coming, coming in and out, it can be distracting for kids, which I know is really hard for parents who are balancing like a hundred thousand things during the day at once. Um, but if you can dedicate um, some bigger blocks of time to sit with your child, that's going to be better than being like one minute in, one minute out, one minute in, one minute out. Because think about all those transitions for the child. Um, so think about setting up the space in the same way, having your space nearby them in the same kind of structure, um, and thinking about, is there a way that I can think about my time and my responsibilities to spend to spend um, big, big, bigger chunks of time with them. So I'm minimizing the transition of the parent coming in and out of the learning environment. Great, thank you. Also, I wanna keep toys out of her field of vision and hands during class, but often they help her focus. Can, yeah. you, recommend can you recommend specific fidget toys that can help her expend her extra energy, but don't steal her focus the way a toy inevitably will? Yeah, that's a good question. There's always a balance, right? Um, because some kids actually do benefit from fidget toys. It, it does help their attention. Some kids, um, it's so engrossing that it's not helping their attention. Um, and it's just taking all of their attention. Um, and this is really, I think it's, it's an individualized question, like whether the fidget toy is actually more of a distractor or more of a help, um, or is it the type of toy maybe um, that is is getting in the way. And, and that's an individualized kind of problem. Um, so it might be that um, you try a couple of different things to see, okay, is, is any item relatively less distracting? Um, and, you know, a lot of the classic fidget items are either squishy balls or, or um, like slime or some, some of those like, um, uh, like little connected like tubes and things that you can kind of crinkle around um, and try a couple of them if you have access to them and see which one of them is seems to be the least distracting of them all. But if you're finding that they're all very distracting, I might think about whether this is actually going to be a helpful strategy for your child um, because there are some kids who just are more interested in the fidget toy than they are in the learning environment, but the fidget toy is meant to be there to help their focus, not to take away from it. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily um, work for all kids. Um, and I will also say there are a lot of like um, 
household items that can be used as fidget toys that aren't anything fancy or anything branded as a fidget toy. I think if you think about your own experience, like I know for me, I have, I have things, I can see them in my desk that I fidget with um, all the time. Like one's a rubber band, like one's a paper clip. Um, and so like you might just have household things that um, are just interesting to feel or interesting to touch. Um, that you're, you could try and use with your child that's not as exciting as like slime or, um, you know, um, a ball that they can throw around the room. So be creative. It doesn't have to be like your Amazon's best sensory toy. Um, see if there's something you can find that's maybe a little less exciting that might be helpful. Sure. So let's see. I have one here. Do you have any tips for single parents that are also working from home? I have to give her a device to keep her busy while I do my meetings and etc. It is challenging to transition back even with a visual timer. Yeah, I think this is like the, um, if I had the answer to this question, that would be uh, very popular. Um, it's, it's, um, this this I, is so hard, and I think for for working parents, single parents, um, uh, balancing how to manage getting your own work done, helping your child with virtual school, um, and uh, I think a lot of parents um, also experience this guilt of like I'm just putting them in front of the screen because what else am I going to do? I have to do something to to get my work done. Um, and so <laughs> I hear, I hear that and, and you're not alone. Um, I think this is, uh, uh, many, many, many families are, are in the same boat. Um, and, um, I think, yes, I'm glad that you're using a visual timer. Um, it's, that's a great strategy. Sometimes when, uh, items are really highly reinforcing like screens and iPads and games, um, those transitions are really tough. So maybe trying to think about a menu of activities that she can do independently. Um, like, uh, are there any toys that she can engage with that don't need your assistance where she can play independently? Um, some other activities where you could like have a list of things that she can do on her own without your assistance um, and try and save the iPad one for um, you know, those really like those, those long meetings or the, you know, the times when you really need it, but don't try and see if there's a variety of things that you can get her engaged in. So it's not just iPad all the time. Um, and, uh, and trying to, um, trying to keep transitioning, um, on and off that. Um, but yes, it's a, it's, it's definitely a common, a common concern. I also forgot to mention, but I, I know that some of these questions had come up in the previous uh, prior email um, that there are um, there are ways this is not directly related to your question but it made me think about families who have asked about how to limit distractions when their child is engaged in learning and they're getting distracted by other apps and other things on their um, iPad or computer um, and I would definitely recommend looking into the um, parental settings on the devices um, they all should have them and they are they do allow for different um, levels of control like you can block access to different apps when um, for certain times or permanently and they're under a password that you have not the child so I would definitely look into that if you're if you have a kid who is just like getting on the iPad and then like doing other stuff um, and think about is there a way that you could structure that learning time a little bit more and put some control in it that's a great that's a great thing to mention I know we've seen questions about that uh, in, in other, other webinars, not limited to just this. Uh, and actually it was something that our co-director of the Autism Initiative brought up to me the other day. Uh, parents, we will be sharing some information on how to better access the accessibility features on these technological devices. And we also have some tips on how to limit and block those distractions and apps that, that just creep their way into <laughs> existence as we go along. Uh, yes, we have a question here. My school asks kids to do independent learning during their very brief breaks. I started to have my daughter skip this work altogether. Are there strategies you recommend when the school is asking the child to stay at their desk during breaks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would definitely recommend, um, I'm not sure if, if 
your child has an IEP or, or their school setting, but um, I would say certainly if your child has an IEP, this is something I would want to talk about with your team and say, um, like in this, um, you know, in this home learning environment, it is really challenging for her to stay at the desk and it may be different in the school setting, um, but coming up with some collaboration with, with your um, either with the teacher or with your um, IEP team around some accommodations specifically for at home around um, how to use those breaks because um, for some kids that's that's enough for them that's enough of a brain break of doing something else um, and they can't sit and for other kids they really do need to get up and get around so if that's if if, if your kid is one of those kids who, who needs to get up and do something different I would definitely advocate for adding that in um, as an accommodation on the IEP. Sure a uh, question would you be able to help my son get a new evaluation? My son was diagnosed with autism when he was two, almost three, right before the pandemic. So he wasn't able to receive any help, unfortunately. I'd like to put him in school because he'll be four in April. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that um, evaluate the evaluation process has, um, you know, definitely undergone a lot of changes um, due to COVID. Um, so I know that schools, um, schools are still doing evaluations. They look a little bit different than they were before, um, since there's a, a fair amount of virtual um, component to them. Um, so um, it's something you can still follow up with. Um, I can't remember how how old your your child is at this point, turning four, I think. Um, so either with the the CPSE. Um, team um, to request an evaluation. And if you want to pursue a private evaluation, our center does, um, does, does see families. Um, we currently are seeing families both virtual and in person. Um, so um, I can, I will um, put in the chat um, the information for our um, uh, intake department, our care management department, um, so that if you're interested in, in services at the Child Study Center and evaluation, you can contact them. Thank you so much, Dr. Doggett. That's really helpful. And we'll also be sure to include that in the follow-up email that I'll be sending you all with not only the links that were included in this presentation, but also a link to the recording, uh, which we'll be able to share with you for a limited time, uh, whether you are here here are you registered? So thank you for that. Uh, quick question. Uh, my son has a lot of echolalia and when he doesn't want to do work, he does a lot of repetitive questions. I feel to get the wrong response for me so he can have a tantrum. Questions can be pizza now, TV now, so I can answer not now or no. What can I do to support him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, it's a really good question. Um, it seems like um, there, there's a couple of things, um, the couple of things I would think about. One is also giving him some uh, other tools for communication. So it may be that you could um, provide him with um, those prompts for language around the break or, um, uh, you know, doing some, you know, a uh, movement or something, give him a card that he can give you to as a functional way of communicating rather than that, like, demand um, where you say, where you say no. And I think um, a lot of, we do see kids with ASD do a lot of repetitive question asking. <clears throat> and um, if, if that's the case, um, you're right in your instinct of, of um, trying to limit your engagement with the repetitive question asking. Um, you can answer the question, um, <clears throat> but I think once it, um, once it keeps repeating, you can direct back to something else like pointing to their visual schedule saying like right now it's, it's time for music or whatever it is on the schedule. Um, uh, you can also use those first then um, boards. I had an image on one of the slides where you can have a picture of what's going on now and what's coming up. And uh, so that you can refer to first, uh, you know, first uh, music class, then break and keep referring to the schedule and the expectation and try not to engage with the, re the repetition of the no, 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 you can't do that uh, answer to the question. Great. All right, Dr. Doggett, we wanna be respectful of your time and everyone else's time. One final question, if you will, please. Uh, how do I encourage ethics during this time of online uh, virtual learning? Encourage ethics? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sure, let me 
Let me read it one more time. Maybe I skipped a word. How do I encourage good learning ethics during this oh, period of learning. online learning? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was like, oh, good ethics. That's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> that's a big uh, question. <laughs> uh, it sounds like kind of like good learning practices, good learning habits. Mm -hmm. um, um, so yeah, and I, I don't know how old how old the, the student is, um, but I think uh, it's, it's around kind of um, setting some clear um, some clear expectations and boundaries, but also rewarding a child for when they're when they're meeting those and doing them right. Because sometimes it's hard to feel like learning and homework, endless classes is you know is rewarding. Um, and so trying to think about how can I praise and reward and keep that motivation going, um, that's going to help them feel like they want to keep doing it because. Um, School, school can be a drag sometimes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so as much as you can praise the good things that you're seeing, like I really like that you're working hard on your math. I know it's hard for you. Um, and uh, you know, praise persistence, praise attention, um, reward good efforts, um, reward good grades if you can. Like all those things are gonna, gonna help them feel like this is, this is motivating. Great, all right, well, thank you, thank you. So that concludes our question and answer session with Dr. Doggett. I just wanna thank everybody for being here today. Uh, please remember you can check our calendar for future events. Uh, there you'll see the next webinars we'll be having, including an announcement for the rest of our January lineup. I know next week we're, we're gonna be talking about the AIMS program um, and the DOE. And then following that, we'll be talking about Turn in Five and understanding the kindergarten IEP. Uh, and then we'll be talking specifically with an attorney about navigating special education during COVID-19. Um, so that's all coming up in the next week or two. And I'll be sure to include that information in the email that I share with you. Lastly, I just wanna remind you, if you have any needs on the, what we offer in terms of workshops or education advocacy assistance, uh, please be sure to contact us and reach out at our intake line at 212-643-2840, Monday through Friday, or you can email them at intake at Synergia New York, uh, NY .org. We can help you there with referrals and access for your loved ones and also give you assistance in directing you for OPWDD services. Lastly, I just wanna take a moment to uh, ask your help as we try and bring more programming and better programming and better timed programming for you. If you will please uh, help us by taking this quick poll. Uh, it's really quick. Uh, it's just three questions just to help us understand when is the best time to conduct these, also which platform you prefer, and also the webinar styles. We want to make sure that we're hitting everyone's needs and, and questions during these times. Uh, but yes, Dr. Doggett, thank you so much. Uh, I know you'll be I know you'll be uh, following up with our uh, attendees as well with uh, webinar information uh, for a survey. So we thank you for your time and thank you for your expertise. Uh, it's, it's so valuable, especially as we try and navigate these challenging times here uh, during the pandemic. And hopefully we can all come out of this better, but we'll come out a little better thanks to what you've brought us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, Absolutely. And we really appreciate any feedback that you have for the evaluation you'll get through your email. Thank you so much. And yes, guys, I'll stay on for about two or three more minutes so you can complete any surveys and any of that information. But thank you so much again from all of us here at Synergia. Uh, we will follow up with an email again with the link for this recording and the uh, links to that were presented herein. We thank you so much.